I used to work here regularly as doing secondary language arts and social studies, mostly language arts. And I think that if you're all as happy to see Holly as I am. <laughs> it's really nice to come back and have a really friendly audience, you know. I work a lot of schools where they have no idea who I am in this country. <laughs> so it's nice coming with them. And I'm Kim McClung. I've been in the Kent School District since 92. And I taught ninth grade English at Kent Junior High and at KM for 20 years. And last year I worked up with Amy up at the district office, helping her organize all of this um, work that, that we've done. So our learning target for today, to collaborate with each other um, to gain a common understanding of what the expectations for Unit 1 are, both for you and for your students. And then, of course, um, we hope to give you a lot of planning time because one of the things that we realized as we were putting this unit together and the framework together is that a lot of us already have, we already do this, and we already have the lessons, and so what, what we're hoping to give you a lot of time to do is go through the work that you've already done with your students and just figure out, you know, plan out unit one the first um, four to six weeks of the school year so you'll have that done at the end of the day today. How many of you were around back when we were doing Understanding by Design units? Yeah, I think a lot of this you could probably pull those things out and this Common Core goes really well with that. So, we're going to ask you to read briefly through the introduction, if you haven't already, and then read through the framework part of Unit 1. Now, you'll notice the organization of your binder is such that most of it is empty and just dividers because we've only written Unit 1 and Unit 4 so far, and I don't think Unit 4 is in here yet. It's not. Um, so, each, each unit is organized the same. You have a unit overview, and then you have the assessments, the pre- and the post-assessments, and then you have um, planning resources and sample lessons. And those are things that the team wrote or we pulled from our H drives and modified them slightly to, to fit this unit. Um, what we'd like you to do is go ahead and read through the unit overview. And as you're doing it, just what are you noticing and wondering about the way it's organized in the separate part? How might this unit be similar to units you've taught in the past? And what lingering questions do you have? So we're going to give you about 20 minutes to do this reading. And we'll take some questions at the end. So please dig in. Hopefully you've all had a chance to familiarize yourself with the scope and sequence of the unit. What lingering questions do you have? And Holly's going to take them down so that we can get that back to you. Do you have any questions? Um, so when they're talking, they're talking about types of texts, 
And what, when we use that phrase, it more has to do with the level of rigor that the kids have used rather than the specific text that they use. So then it could be that a student was opposed to a text in eighth grade, and then in ninth grade they have the same text. No. That is one thing that, that we're trying to preclude. Okay. Um, that there will be, um, one of the things that he's working on right now is putting together grade level lists of texts. And so what, what we've talked about is that it will be okay to teach down. So for example, if there's something on the eighth grade text list that suggested list that you would like to use, and you ask your kids and none of them have read it, then it's perfectly okay. But it's not okay if something is on the ninth grade left list for an eighth grade teacher to use it. And those are really more anchor text kinds of things, like Odyssey, Running and Juliet, Night. And those lists have existed for a long, for, long yeah. time. Okay. Yeah. We just try and keep so there's the communication there. going between yeah. levels. There's actually a lot of flexibility. There are so many really great resources out there. You know, I was talking to Dave about um, culturally aligned short stories that, that he could use. And there are so many books out there, just full of those. And you're, you'd be welcome, as long as it meets the rigor level for those. Common Core is looking for, you're free to use it. Any other questions? So the list of suggested texts, would it, I guess you were kind of touching on that, but uh, mm -hmm. if, if it's not on this list, like say, I've taught another short story in the past at ninth grade, like uh, my, I was, a specific text was Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut, and would right. it be okay to like, maybe say instead of just teaching one short story I might hit two in a short story unit and use oh, that absolutely. one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no law that even says you have to teach a novel in this first unit. Okay. If you wanted to just focus on short stories, you could do that. Or you could focus on a novel okay. if that's what you want to do. Okay. Can we, so since we're talking about text, can we trust that the text that are listed here in the unit overview on the second page, the suggested text mm -hmm. box, can we trust that those are all, uh, for lack of a better word, like safe? Like none of my 11th grade colleagues are going to come to me and be like, why are you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And a lot of, you'll notice a lot of the first set of short stories are actually from the ninth grade book. Yeah. And so, yeah, those are ninth grade texts. But like, like I said, if a 10th grade teacher wants to do, like a lot at CAM, a lot of our 10th grade teachers do Harrison Bergeron because they like to do, sorry, they like to do a dystopian unit, and it's nice to start with that as a short story. Sorry, right. I know. But, but talk to your staff. You know, if, if you have a group of 10th grade teachers that really, really want to teach something out of here and you don't care, let them, let them have it and vice versa. That's, that's one of the things what we, and I will tell you, and Amy will tell you, she said, there was, that, that was one thing we heard, and that was one thing I kept saying, is, nope, you're getting prescriptive again. Nope, this is prescriptive. Nope, this is prescriptive. And so the, there, we've been watching out for that. But, but also, and I'm sure you guys have dealt with this too, is like the kid, you get pull out a, the textbook, and the kids say, oh, we read that in middle school. And it can be very frustrating. I'm just coming in. Oh, no problem. Um, any other questions? One thing is, if you find out that your kids have been reading in computer in the seventh grade, <laughs> <laughs> let Amy let Amy know that so that she can go track that down. That's that's happened many times. Yeah. If somebody gets anxious and energetic at the middle school and and they want to teach up. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a prestigious thing to teach difficult books. And, uh, but we've, we've made a lot of efforts in the district so the kids aren't reading the same thing over and over and over again. So let her know so that she can communicate for you. So we're ready to move on? All right. So um, we're going to look at the pre-assessment. So just generally, what is the purpose of doing pre- and post-assessment? Seems like a no-brainer, right? But what would you say is the purpose? To direct the instruction, so the kids know what they don't know. Exactly. 
right? To find out how much your kids already know, what they still need to learn in order to get to that post-assessment, right? Here's what we're going to do. So, um, what we're going to ask you guys to do is take the pretest yourselves so that you have a, a really good idea of what it is you're going to need to focus on to get to the post-test successfully. Um, the, all of the pre-test and post-test for this um, framework are meant to be given in the single class period. So, so hopefully that will, and, and this will be, this is kind of our, our test drive. So if you guys can do it in 15 or 20 minutes, which is what we kind of expect teachers to be able to do, then you'll have a good idea of whether the kids can finish in the class period. This is all going to be, or is already digitally available for us too, It right? is, and okay, I, I have a, I was unable to get, for some reason my computer isn't connecting to the server, but I will email you digital copies of pre and post tests. Awesome, thanks a lot. Yeah. So um, here's the deal. It's 9.04. We would like you to take the pretest, and um, we're going to be giving you a form afterwards to kind of go through to help you figure out how you want to teach um, the skills so the kids will be able to do really well on the post-test. Uh, and you have till 10 o'clock, and that includes a break. So, if you would take the pretest and start thinking about what you would like to do, any time between when you finish the pretest and 10 o'clock is your break. Does that make sense? All right, so go ahead. I know, there's a lot of time. Uh, one of the resources that the committee put together was to take a look at your process as you were taking the test. So to think about the things that an expert reader did as you read Fish Cheeks and answered the questions about it. And then on this side, to think about the things that a student would need to do. But I think a sensible way to look at that, and it's kind of something I forget after a while that I used to know how to do, which was a task analysis. Can you really remember that from ed school? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if I needed to compare a theme in two texts, say a poem and a story, what are some, and I'm a kid, what are some of the things I need to know how to do? What is theme? Yes, I need to know what is theme. What does a poem look like? What does a story look like? Okay, so the genres. And uh, Author's purpose. What does compare mean? Keep going. How to find theme in individual text before you compare one. Maybe what's the opposite of compare? Okay. What is not to compare? Right. <laughs> okay, anything else? The, the language, how mm -hmm. the language okay. words to use for comparing. Okay, so what my paper should look like when I'm done with my essay? Is that what you mean? Or what um, the story looks like? The transitional words for how to set up your senses to compare. Like sentence starters, kind of? Yeah, the sentence starters. Yeah, I think the first one, one we want to look for. In both pieces. Yeah. Um, similarly. Right. Anything else? And this is something best done with a friend. Because uh, they'll think of things you can think of based on their own styles of learning. What else? I've always found it was difficult with kids when they were comparing two things that they sometimes do this seesaw thing of 
the poem says this, the story says this, the poem says this, the story says this. Like, how do you organize that to, to write it so that it doesn't sound like a seesaw? So the organization of the writing. Are you assuming essay is an assignment? Because that changes the question for you, too. Well, you know, just say it, say it or write it if you're going to compare them, right? Well. If I'm going to look at your work to see if you actually got it. Right. I, have to I mean, look I, at if, if you had this on a test question, you asked for only a couple of sentences versus an essay, that changes what the students need to know. That's all I'm asking. True, true. So if you're, if we're, asking, we're asking for an extended response. You're assuming that. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm asking you. That's what you meant. I, I have decided it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Know how to blend text evidence with their own words and paraphrasing. Okay, so incorporating evidence. Mm -hmm. They need to know how to elaborate on their evidence, explain it. Yeah, and if evidence is required, they need to know how to introduce that piece of text evidence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like whatever you want to call it, contextual. I know. call it the funnel. Yeah. So we funnel in or embed or what they do. Okay. Anything else? It's interesting, in my latter years in graduate school, I was in graduate school most of my life, but in the latter years it was all about like feminist lens or a deconstruction lens, but I found that the, what they really skipped in a lot of that was just the close reading of something. So you really had to know what the text said in a very careful way to be able to do those more complex things. So, after we do this, then what do you do for task analysis? Anybody remember? Figure out an order. Right? Mm -hmm. So, you'd have to figure out an order of what makes sense to teach first, second, third, and all that. So, what are the parts that need to fit into the other parts for one thing? Um, and then you can organize these by short lessons that you would do. Some people do mini lessons, some people do short short assignments, you could do a couple a couple sentence answer and work your way up to an essay answer. So there'll be a lot of different ways. But think about that when you're figuring out how to teach this stuff to remember about the task analysis. I always compare this to, oh yeah, I used to do that. It's like this recipe I used to make long ago and I forgot about it, but it's back there and back there and it's a really good thing to do because we forget that they may not know some of these things. So, a good reminder. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have you, people probably do not bring this stuff, right? No. So, given that we don't want to reinvent the wheel necessarily, or maybe we do, um, you could go through your H drive and see if there might be some lessons or units or books, or stories or poems that might already fit with this um, unit. And you can work with your friends um, work well and see if there's some things that might already fit with the eye that later on we're going to work on have time to develop some stuff. So now's the time to kind of explore and see what you've got going. Or if you want to develop some stuff with some new colleagues, I know there's a lot of new people in the room here. Thank you.